Good day, everyone. Well, the less than expected increase in wages at 0.3% versus the expected uh, 0.4% um, drove a big part of Friday's rally. The straight up from bottom rallies that we're seeing here, uh, call it dead bad bounce, um, is also due in part to short covering. And uh, that creates those sharp peaks that you see during dead bad bounces. Uh, the CME Fed futures now favors um, a 25 basis point hike over 50 uh, hike uh, when the Fed next meets in February. And uh, the lack of those seeking work post COVID, as well as the surge in retirees. And uh, the Fed also counting those who work two or three jobs uh, as of the creation of two or three jobs makes the reported figures look better than they are in reality, and that explains how the unemployment rate dropped to 3.5% below estimates of 3.7. Now, while uh, wages cooled, uh, a wage uh, sp price spiral can still happen, uh, and that's uh, due to the low supply of workers. Demand, however, is also cooling as major companies uh, such as Apple and Amazon uh, lay off workers. BlackRock and Goldman Sachs believe unemployment will not soar due to the lack of supply and demand, but instead tick higher by just half a percent. And this would go against all other prior recessions when unemployment soared, since companies during recessions eventually have to lay off more employees. And it would seem based on the massive bubble that still has to be unwound that layoffs will be substantial in my way of thinking. Uh, thus, uh, the unemployment rate, while tempered by a significant number that are no longer looking for work, will still rise well beyond that of just half a percent. Tomorrow, we've got the uh, CPI uh, number and core CPI is estimated at 0.3% versus last month's 0.1%. Shelter, which makes up 40% of the CPI, can remain stubbornly high, though the Fed recognizes this. Uh, they said that uh, they are therefore more likely to put uh, weight on other shelter metrics, which are less lagging, such as the rate for new leases, which is coming down. And further, the PCE, uh, which is the Fed's favorite indicator, uh, does focus on that. So. I think that uh, the CPI nevertheless is an important number. And so if it comes in above the estimated 0.3%, I would expect markets to react negatively to that. Um, and I think the question is when, uh, not if something breaks, that forces the Fed to pivot as companies lay off employees at a faster hey, pace. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the, expected numbers for tomorrow the cpi the non-core is expected at uh there's there's two consensus numbers i'm seeing 0.1 and zero and that's versus that's a prior a 0.1 and then the core is is you have 0 0.4 is a forecast 0 0.3 is the consensus this is briefing.com and the last yeah. time the prior number was 0 0.2 so if we come in at at the 0 0.3 0 0.4 on the core we're still higher than the prior month, which seems to imply that there is no real downtrend in inflation. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and that's a good point. And uh, the market, uh, of course, could reason that that is yet another um, point of worry. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what, what happens tomorrow. But, uh, you know, if it, if it hits 0.3 percent, I, I would think that there would be some commentary um, on, on that point that, you know, we're, why aren't we going lower? Um, and there's a lot of stuff to worry about. And, uh, you know, in, in bull markets, the market climbs a wall of worry. Uh, in bear markets, the market uh, bounces um, on walls of worry uh, because nothing goes down in a straight line. And you can see uh, over the last 12 months, well, you can see since the market peaked, uh, that uh, we've had some pretty gnarly bounces in there. Um, and this is no different from prior bear markets like 2000 to 2002 or 1930 to 1932. And I think the question is going to be uh, when, not if something breaks. So, um, uh, you know, companies ultimately are going to have to 
start laying off employees, um, we've just started to see a trickle from major companies. Um, and uh, I think that when the Fed does pivot, uh, the magnitude of that pivot is going to depend on the seriousness of the black swan. Um, and uh, as shown in this graph here, QE 1 to 3 was due to the financial collapse of 2008. Uh, QE 4 was due to COVID. And uh, you can see that the bars get bigger each time. Um, and QE4, of course, you know, quite, I think that represents uh, all the Q prior QEs combined uh, and then some. So, you know, QE5 is going to be interesting. And, uh, you know, if, if history is any guide, right, right now, like if you look at uh, the uh, interest rates since um, Volcker hiked uh, into double digits, so basically since 1980, um, interest rates bounce, but bounce smaller and smaller each cycle. And this is the first cycle where they're not bouncing smaller. They've, they bounce larger than, than the prior cycle. Um, and I think that encourages something else to break. I think the rates are too high right now uh, for things to run smoothly. And uh, we still have at least another two uh, rate hikes of 25 basis points. Um, a, lot of, a lot of banks are thinking and met Fed members actually, uh, uh, the dot plot shows that uh, the Fed members right now cluster around uh, 500 to 525 basis points is the terminal rate. So that implies three more 25 basis point rate hikes. Um, of course, that's data dependent. And uh, I, I just, I don't, I mean, inflation, sure, it, it, it's overall should come down. <laughs> I mean, we've never raised rates so fast in the history of interest rates you know going from basically close to zero percent to to where we are now 420 425 to 450 on the federal funds rate so that's kind of a shock to the system and uh, you know we have a number of metrics like uh, housing you know we have some records uh, that were set in housing uh, because interest rates rose so fast mortgage rates of course uh, the 30-year mortgages um, jumped uh, hugely. And so that, that creates quite a bit of instability. Uh, that said, I, I heard somewhere, read somewhere that uh, the majority of people in the US, very high number, I think have fixed rate mortgages. So basically they're trapped. They can't sell because they need to keep that lower rate of interest. Um, but at least it doesn't affect the, the majority of people uh, in terms of the uh, way the 30 year interest rates have, have soared. Uh, in the UK, it's not as good. I think there's a, a, a substantially larger number of people who are not on fixed rates. So they're, they're, they're going to get affected more. And uh, companies like Goldman have said that the uh, UK is probably, probably already in recession um, and, and the GDP should, should go negative by um, a fair amount. Um, but Goldman's also, this, this is all relative. They say EU and UK are going to be negative GDP and in recession if they aren't already. Whereas they're saying that the U.S. is going to stay at like a, a low, a low percentage, but not negative, which, um, you know, it, it just makes me laugh because Goldman and a lot of these banks, they're in the business of sales, they're in the business of selling, business of keeping things optimistic. They don't want to use the R word. Uh, that, that's, that's the word that, uh, you know, means uh, less business for them. Uh, and I remember this uh, study I did in the year 2000, which was an eye opener for me, where I saw that unemployment soars during recessions and but it starts off really low and so even though in the year 2000 when i wrote this piece um unemployment was at record lows and i called for the recession i call i said you know what i think this is inevitable based on history you know unemployment's going to soar and we're going to have a recession and that study was denounced uh by some of these banks just because they don't like anyone saying the r word uh, but sure enough, we had a nasty recession in 2001. And I think uh, those of you who traded through the year 2000 to 2002 know, know how brutal those three years were, uh, where the NASDAQ lost 78% of its value. So at any rate, um, yeah, let's, let's watch and see, uh, you know, what happens next. But uh, it seems like um, in, the, in the, the, the history of things in this cycle, um, a black swan probability is greater now than ever before since QE started in uh, late 2008. Gil, how are you seeing everything? Yeah, I think you can boil it down to a very simple theory, um, which we actually talked about earlier last year, and I think we were calling it the wild card theory, which is essentially that the Fed is going to run the economy into the ground. They're like a 
they're driving a, a car very rapidly at a wall, but they don't know exactly where that wall is and they're going to hit it. So we expect a policy error, which could create a black swan. And then once the, the consequences of that black swan are clear, then we'll figure you'll be able to figure out what stocks are going to do. Because I wouldn't necessarily assume that if the Fed pivots and starts easing, that stocks necessarily just start shooting higher. Because in the past, we've seen when the Fed is raising rates and triggers a bear market, they have to start lowering for a period of time before the market actually turns around. So the assumption that, you know, oh, okay, there, there's your black swan, the Fed has now pivoted, and now stocks are going to take off. Because what happens is if you get some sort of a extreme economic crash or, or severe recession, which is what I think they're probably headed for, uh, then you will see liquidity be sapped from the system. And so that, that will affect stocks. And you have to think about that, I think. So that's really the key. Meanwhile, I think you just pay attention to what the charts are doing. And so you do have this rally off the lows. It, it looks, you know, Friday's rally on the jobs number, and I guess there's uh, some bad ISM number number that came out. Non-manufacturing, I think it was 49.4, but previously it was 54. So it went from expansion to contraction and also factory orders came in much worse than they thought. I think it's minus 1.8 versus expectations of minus 0.4, something like that. In any case, the market graphs onto that as indicative of an imminent Fed pivot. But we've known this for, for a while that the market was doing this because we've already been long. I got all these charts up here. Which one do I want? We've already been long um, gold and silver since uh, November. So, you know, these just continue to go higher. They look like they're in position now to roll back. You've got the CPI number tomorrow. I, I think what will happen is the CPI will come in as expected, but the market will sell off. We'll see. Uh, I think this rally seems to be overdone at this point. And, you know, it's just like a mad rush back in the stocks as if everything is going to turn out uh, well. And uh, that's that. OK, so, you know, other names that we've looked at uh, as being viable in in the bases and whatnot is stuff like Goldfields, which is gapped up to a new high today. And it's it's coming in. These are extended at Anglo Gold Ashanti. Same thing. So they're going to come in and maybe we find some spots to buy them on the pullbacks and we'll just have to see how that goes. This morning we sent out a report on Ford and General Motors. They've been rallying these things like, look at this this rally. This is a, what a nine day rally, nine days up in a row. Now you run into the 50 day line. It's shortable in here, I think, using the 50 day line as uh, your covering guy, which I think is like a 13, what is that? Let me get a better read on this. 1307. So you're hanging right in there. So you can use, you know, that plus 1% or 2% depending on your risk preference because it could theoretically rally to the 200-day line. But if the market rolls back, this is likely where this will roll back. General Motors is another one to look at. Um, again, uh, eight out of nine days up. I mean, that's this is just kind of goofy. And look at the volume isn't that heavy. So you know what this is all about. It's just a pile in based on this idea that the Fed is going to turn uh, and start lowering rates again or, or flatten out or, or end or terminate, whatever you want to want to call it, sooner than later and at a lower level than they think. And again, I would assume the Fed really doesn't know what they're doing. And we know that for a fact because, uh, you know, they assured us last year that inflation was transitory and, you know, don't worry. And then they suddenly found themselves having to respond, as Chris was pointing out, with these huge interest rate increases. So I I think that the high probability bet at this point is that they're going to screw up. And so we'll work it from there. But again, it all comes down to what you're seeing on the charts. And we we saw that the precious metals were turning and the, and the miners also were turning back in uh, October, November. So now they've rallied for a while. Now I turn on CNBC and they've got this fast money group, which I think has got to be the biggest bunch of losers I've ever seen in my life babbling about how now is the time for gold and it's going to do great in 2023. That makes me nervous. So maybe it's time for a pullback in the space. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, if you look at the the index charts today, you got a little doji here on the S&P. Looks like an abandoned baby or whatever you want to call it, an island type top. Let's see if I make this a... Uh, yeah, you got the same thing a little up here, a, a gap up and it's spinning around. Uh, near the 50-day line, that's the NASDAQ. And uh, S&P is still well below the 200-day line. So you're in a position where you could back off. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, if I'm looking at some ideas this morning, uh, 
I'll just go through a couple of short lists. I mean, I think everything's going to hinge on what happens tomorrow. So if you see a, uh, a much lighter than expected CPI, then the market will rally. If, if it's, I think if it comes in line or does not really reflect any kind of reversal in the trend, then I think you have the potential for uh, a sell-off. So, you know, it could go either way. And I think you really have to be ready, assuming you even want to play. You know, we still view this as a bear market and bear markets will have rallies that can last for several weeks and you're still in a bear market, you know, so that, that doesn't really change the equation. Um, so, you know, I want to have things on the long side and the short side, but just some things I'm noticing today, you got Amazon pushing above the 50 day line on a pocket pivot volume signature. I don't know what's going on with Denny's. It's a lousy restaurant, but they're, they've been going nuts. The builders are, have all been trending higher. You've got KB home reporting earnings after the close. And this is another group that would seem to hinge on where interest rates go. And it has primarily been uh, in an up, uptrend since, uh, well, since about as long as gold and silver have, so, uh, and the miners. And so it's part of, I think, the general theme here, and I think they will react tomorrow. I like this extreme networks uh, hanging out, forming a base, holding support along the 10-day line. You have a pocket pivot here. That would have been last, uh, what, what's today, Wednesday, so last Thursday. And then another pocket pivot uh, on Monday and stalling a little bit, but trying to turn here. So that one looks interesting. First solar is a new high price ground, surprise. But I would watch this for a possible double top because it rolls back below these lows here, which are at, uh, let's say, uh, 173.68. So we're trading at 174.05 right now. Uh, if it rolls back below that low, it could trigger a double top type short sale entry. Uh, gold fields, I already showed you this one. It just gapped higher. Notice how it approaches this peak here. So it's a little double toppy now. I think you're coming into the 10-day and the 20-day. That's where I like it. Canada Goose is just going crazy. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's all the cold weather. Uh, Home Depot trying to pull off a pocket pivot, but it's extended here. I'm just wondering what's going on with, with some of these retails. They've been going, uh, they've been running pretty good to the upside lately, but you know, so is everything else. So I'm not really sure because if we go into a severe economic recession in 2023, I don't anticipate that the retail sector is going to do that well. So we'll just see how that plays out. Uh, the harmonic is another one that's interesting, but it knows how it's a little double toppy here. I think if you wanted to play this long, you had to get in here last Friday. Uh, notice how that move started with the, uh, the uh, Fed pivot rally last Friday after the jobs number. Uh, what else? Juniper Networks holding tight along the 10 and the 20. So this is kind of my, you know, let's watch this and see how it how it does. I think it looks pretty interesting. Um, here's some more builders moving higher. So if we look at some other stuff I was looking at, Sienna hanging tight in here, a little bit double toppy, but it, it's acting pretty well. So I watched that one and I watched Juniper. Uh, as potential uh, cohorts, uh, they could, if they break down, you know, this bust to 10 and the 20 and then the 50, then of course it's a short sale entry. If uh, if it can hold, then, you know, it may play out as a long. So that's a name I would be keeping an eye on. I also have liked, uh, I think we talked about some of this uh, last week. Uh, the Coppers, for example, you have uh, Freeport, launched last week i think we were talking about exactly a week ago as it was moving and looking like it was going to post a pocket pivot that day which it did and now you've just gotten extended you see the same thing with southern copper just that thing's just going nuts uh and also rio tinto is another uh copper but that's extended and it's starting to pull back and last but not least you have uh bhp which is either BHP Group or BHP Billiton, depending on what service you look at uh, on the chart. But you can see this is extended, and so it's coming back in. But these are areas that have done well. Also, we've talked about Alcoa in the past, and now it's above the 200-day line. Should it reverse back below, that could trigger a short. But it was Bible when it was tight along the moving averages, and we picked that up last Wednesday in our uh, live webinar at that point. Um, also, Century Aluminum, same type of situation. Uh, it was very tight here along the 10, 20, and 50 day. You got the 65 day exponential in there now, but notice that it's running into the 200 day line where it could become shortable. So, some of these things, you know, that I'm looking at Ford and General Motors, you can look around, you'll see other 
areas where you've got rallies into uh, moving average resistance, those could become shortable tomorrow, depending on how things play out after the CPI number. Um, what else? We have uh, a lot of the steels have rallied uh, since Friday, and, and they were even turning before then. You see the undercut and rally here on steel dynamics. But now you're getting close to uh, double top land. Uh, U.S. Steel, similar thing. Notice how it triggered a double top short sale entry earlier this morning. It came back below this left side peak right here at uh, 27.64, and now it's rolling back the other way. So there you go. That's a live uh, live setup in process. Nucor looks like it's back in double top land. Uh, ArcelorMittal, this one just extended. Uh, I'll also notice that Albemarle looks potentially shortable around here. Watch what happens as it pushes up through the 20-day line. This has been in a, a pretty extended and consistent downtrend for the past couple of months. And I think, you know, we talked about this before. That's because the whole electric vehicle thing is basically a fantasy. You know, where are you going to get all the batteries and all the metals for the batteries and convert 376 million vehicles in the U.S. to all electric <laughs> and and what are you going to charge them with? What sort of a electric grid, uh, given that most of the electric grids in the country are old and seem to fail half the time? So that's that's been coming down. And, of course, that's brought down names like uh, Livent, which is now rallying. Of course, these are going to turn uh, with a vengeance, and they are. And so, you know, here they go. So we'll see where they end up as they run into potentially shortable resistance. And that's basically all I've got. I got a few ideas in my back pocket that I'm watching. I'm watching the miners as they pull back because I think that they need to uh, pull back. And I got some short sale targets to work. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to because the market today, you know, you're getting the same thing you had uh, yesterday. We're just spun back and forth and back and forth. It looks weak, it looks strong. It looks weak, it looks strong. And then it just spins around and doesn't really go much of anywhere. And that's what it's doing today. And I think that's pretty evident in the uh, the chart of the S and P and the chart of the Nasdaq, which are in these little narrow narrow doji ranges, and they're spinning around. So that's just indicative of what we're seeing, and that that may continue for the rest of the day. So I say have some ideas in your back pocket. I've covered a few things I like. We know we like the miners, uh, and they're starting to pull back. We know that we like precious metals if the market's going to rally, and for some reason tomorrow's CPI number confirms the Fed pivot uh scenario and uh, we'll just see what happens because I, I think it's probably at least good for a tradable rally but then it may just simply run out of gas um and then roll over again so you know a lot of uh, possibilities here i think you just have to be ready for everything that said unless you're a, a you know a, a fast action uh gunslinging swing trader i don't think this is the market for you it's not a trending market the only thing we've been able to find that's trending has been the precious metal space and for all we know that that trend is now reaching a short-term terminus where you're going to have to see um, some of these names. If we just look at the GDX as a sort of a uh, proxy for the whole group, you can see you know, that maybe it needs to pull in and set up and base again. So similar to what it did after the big move in November, and then it had to base for a period of time, about a month, and it's broken out again in 2023. We may need to see some uh, consolidation here as well. So we'll see how this plays out. But that's all I've got. Are there any questions before we wrap it up? <clears throat> no, Chris, you got anything? You know, I, I was just looking at the weekly on, you know, pick a major average uh, NASDAQ. And if you look at the weekly, uh, well, let's just go back to 2018. You can see that markets are lovely uh, in terms of their predictability. Um, so, you know, in 2018, the Fed was tightening its balance sheet. And so we had the first Christmas crash on record. And then we went to, uh, oh, well then Powell reversed course. And so, you know, before the year was out, um, we started to rally and uh, had that nice bounce uh, in, you know, through 2019, then COVID came along and then the Fed had to do the mother of all um, uh, money printing missions. And of course, uh, we went straight up from there uh, with you know a few minor pullbacks along the way. And then uh, late 2021, uh, uh, Powell went hawkish and we put out reports that he's changed his tune. And so expect headwinds ahead. And sure enough, we've been in this nice uh, downtrend since then. So when, when you look at the weeklies, it gives you this broad view perspective on uh, the predictive nature of markets on a longer term time frame. Uh, and I think that's 
that's pretty cool. I mean, it puts you on the right side of the market and also explains uh, why the MDM has been quite successful uh, since it had that major um, change. Uh, I wouldn't say major, I would say material change uh, in early 2019. Uh, and uh, that was designed to prevent the whipsaws and to capture the major trends. So obviously macro plays a, a fairly decent role in terms of um, the way the MDM uh, is, uh, is, is utilized um, in addition to all the other things that uh, go into it. But uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. And one last um, thing, somebody, if, somebody had a question yeah. on OR, they wanted my, they wanted thoughts on OR. Well, I mean, can, can you read a chart? <laughs> what is there to tell you? It's in a base. So, you know, what else am I supposed to tell you? If you're going to buy it, you should have bought it off the 50 day line last week uh, or the last day of the year. And then it popped off of there. It posted a pocket pivot. That would have been, I guess, Tuesday of last week after New Year's Day. So, you know, and it's in a base. So I think right now supporters at the 10 and the 20, uh, like around 1240 to 44. And that's basically what you're looking at. But I like the, the base looks fine. So even if we look at it on a, on a weekly chart, that looks pretty good. And you're in a long term consolidation. And you're actually near, you know, prior highs over the last three years, actually four years. So is that right? One, two, one, two, three. One. Yeah, three years, let's say. Um, well, maybe we're more than that. Yeah, even. Yeah. So, you know, you're up against all time highs here. So this could break out. This is definitely one name to have on your list. And of course, we've discussed it in our weekend focus list report. So. Anyways, that's that for now, you guys. Thanks for showing up. Again, tomorrow the CPI number is probably going to determine where the short-term direction uh, goes from here. And uh, just fasten your seatbelts if you're going to play it and have some ideas on either side of the market. Maybe some ideas can function as both long and short ideas, depending on how things play out tomorrow. So anyways, that's it. Take care, everyone. We'll catch you guys uh, next week. So long, everyone. <laughs>